UN 영어 뉴스 The Upsides of Feeling Small 빌링 인시그니 피컨트 can be good for you to kick off a new BBC future series called Immense t i s Richard Fisher explores the benefits of embracing vastness a week or so after my father died I stood at the foot of Il w i d f a formerly known as Snowdon in North Wales. My wife and I were visiting for a few hours to take her breath, a moment away from the shock aftermath and the grim bureaucracy of a sudden family death. It was a wet, overcast day, too harsh to climb any mountains. So we stopped at the viewpoint just off the A498. Looking towards the peaks, I remember tracing the path of a water pipe that clung to a vertiginous slope. It began on the valley floor at a hydroelectric power station built in the early 20th century before rising up into the mist with so much low cloud. I couldn't see the summits of the mountains, nor the top of the pipe, so was left with my imagination. I pictured the slope continuing upwards indefinitely, never reaching a finite peak, but carrying on and on, that day, with more mortality in my thoughts, I could feel nothing but overwhelm overwhelmed, but at the moment, It felt cathartic, almost fulfilling, to let my mind run up into the clouds and to be reminded of how small I was. I've since had a similar feeling, starting out at the ocean, staring out at the ocean, my imagination wandering. to its unknowable depths while looking at the stars, speculating how far the light had traveled across the universe to reach my retina. Encountering things far bigger than yourself can provoke a mixture of emotions, astonishment, wonder, awe, but also humility. Back in the 18th century, writers and intellectuals thought to define this composition of feelings as sublime, moments where the imagination meets no check. To describe it, they used words like terrible joy, delightful horror, or rude kind of magnificence. Through the sublime, they found a deeper sense of meaning about their place within the world, as well as an awareness of the powers and the limits of their own intellect. As the essayist Joseph Edison wrote in 1712, our imagination loves to be filled with an object or to grasp at anything that is too big for its capacity. We are full on into a pleasing astonishment at such unbounded views and feel a delightful stillness. and amazement in the soul at the apprehension of them. Sometimes it's easy to forget that there is a vast and obscure world still out there waiting to be explored. Perhaps it's because so much of life is now mediated via a smartphone screen no bigger than our palms. Perhaps it's over-familiarity, what was wild and remote in the 18th century is now full of tourists, or as close as a Google search away. Or maybe it's that we've simply stopped looking, after all, the present moment 
is already overwhelming enough through information overload, accelerating technologies, injustice, climate change, and more. However, there are many benefits to be discovered by connecting with things far bigger than the individual itself, individual self. That's why over the coming months, the BC future will be exploring the sublime experience in all its forms in a new series called Immensity. Through stories from the worlds of science, philosophy, psychology, and history, our goal is to reinvigorate the meaning of the sublime and reveal how to see the world with fresh eyes, nature at its grandest, and the human world at its most awe-inspiring. But first, let's start with a straightforward question. How can it be a good thing to feel overwhelmed by something immense, sublime world? When the poet William Wordsworth was a boy, he stole a boat in England's Lake District. As he rode out into the water, proud of his mischief and skill, a huge peak unreared its head, upreared its head. Frightened, it felt as if the mountain was chasing him. Growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars. With a purpose of its own, he rushed back to shore and felt troubled for days. A decade or so later, in his early twenties, Wordsworth was over and well overwhelmed in the mountains again, but this time it was more complex than boyhood fear. As he describes in his autobiographical poem, The Prelude, it was in the early hours of the morning, when the moon's light revealed an awe-inspiring view on the slopes of Snowdon. He and a friend had decided to climb to the summit in the hope of seeing the sunrise. Instead, they saw an uncommon meteorological phenomenon called a temperature inversion, during which a hiker can walk above the clouds. As he did later recall, at my feet rested a silent sea of holy mist. A hundred hills, their dusky backs upheaved all over this still ocean. The hint of threat and mystery had not fully dissipated, however, in the dark gaps between the cloud he observed. In the dark gaps between the cloud, he observed a fixed abysmal, gloomy, breathing place through which he could hear the distant power of nature, the roar of water, torrents, streams, innumerable, roaring with one voice. Seeing and hearing this, he reflected on the human intellect, intellect, uh, intellect ability to approach something far bigger than the self. There I beheld the emblem of a mind that feeds upon infinity, a mind sustained by recognition of a transcendent power. Wordsworth Word's was far from the only writer in this period to be compelled by a sense of the infinite. He and many others in 18th century Europe were fascinated with the sublime, finding new appreciation for the dynamic power and the inner multi they found in nature. In their writing, you can find the lists of settings where such experiences could be found for one 
더서 블라인 민트 프로스펙스 오브 오픈 샴페인 오픈 샴페인 컨트리 오브 베스트 언 컬티베이티드 데저트 데저트 오브 휴지 힙스 오브 마운틴스 하이 록스 앤드 프리스 피스스 오브 와이드 익스펜스 오브 워터스 포 어너들 볼드 오브 행위 스레트닝 크립스 썬더 크라우드스 타워링 업 인투 더 헤븐스 볼케이노스 With their all destroying violence, hurricanes, with the devastation they leave behind, the boundless ocean set into a lazy, a lofty waterfall on a mighty river, while there was some disagreement on the edgy cases, animals, art, even intolerable stenches, generally vastness, vastness, obscurity. and a hint of a benign threat was central to the sublime's definition. Also important was a distinction between the beautiful, that which was light and delicate, smooth and polished, a tended garden or bucolic woodland had beauty, they believed. But the sublime provided something more complex an enriching connection between the intellect and the object of the best skill or dynamic power. Crucially, it brought a touch of discomfort, humility, or even pain when a mountain, storm cloud, or waterfall diminished the self. It was a reminder of one's own vulnerability and the finite existence but felt safely at a distance. A sweet sh sh shudder, as one German philosopher put it, one thing that made the sublime so appealing to one's source and others was how it stretched the imagination. As the philosopher Emily Brady writes in her 2013 book on the sublime, a view running through several theories is that as the imagination, or more generally, the mind, is expanded, we also experience a sense of our ability to take in vastness or great power, thereby evoking a sense of our own powers. Or as one 18th century writer put it, the mind derives a noble pride from encountering a sense of immensity and entertains a lofty, lofty conception of its own capacity. To illustrate this, Brady cites the emotional experience of staring at the night sky. In casting our eyes across it, we cannot take it all in, she writes. We can look to the left and the right and all around, but it seems to go on forever, filling space and extending outwards in all directions in such a way that we cannot put any boundaries around it through perception. Through this kind of aesthetic experience, we have a kind of sensuous feeling for the infinite, one which is quite different from any kind of intellectual, mathematical idea of it. Feeling all. Over the past two decades, psychologists have converged on these 200 year old ideas of the sublime. But from a different angle, and by doing so, they have, they have illuminated other more specific benefits of feeling small in the face of enormity. Two decades ago, the cognitive scientist Adelcha Keltner and Jonathan Haidt were seeking to understand what they saw as the more neglected emotions and they became particularly intrigued by the experience of awe. After immersing themselves in accounts from history, art, anthropology, and religion, they settled 
on a definition. Or they concluded. Or they concluded is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. Why there is some disagreement about whether this makes or a category of the sublime or vice versa. The two are clearly entwined through a combination of laboratory experiments and surveys spanning 26 countries. Keltner and colleagues have since found that all comes in many guises as well as being prompted by nature. The people in their studies described all in encounters with life and death, great music, visual design, or in moments of spirituality, epiphany, or moral beauty, that everyone experienced all in the same way, and that there were cultural differences in how all was mediated, what Keltner calls flavorings, but the feeling of being overwhelmed by something grand, grander, grander than the self was a common thread. This body of work, which Keltner tours in his upcoming book or Penguin, January 2023, has helped to, to clarify that all comes with myriad mental benefits. Various, various studies have shown the experience all can reduce stress, discourage rumination, and enhance well-being. It also fosters greater attention to detail, boosts memory, and increases critical thinking. Read more or the little or speak that could free your mind. Then there are the pro-social benefits. People in all are more likely to show generosity, become less individualist, and emphasize a greater sense of connection to others and the world. For example, when Kartner and Michelle Shota of Arizona State University primed people to feel awe in one experiment by looking at a T T-Rex skeleton in a museum, they were subsequently more likely to describe themselves as part of a community. As Kartner writes, people in the control condition defined themselves in terms of distinct traits and preferences in the spirit of individualism and its privileging of distinctness over common humanity. People feeling awe named the qualities they share with, their, with others, being a college student, belonging to a dense society, being human, being part of the cat category of all science sentient beings. In another study, Catherine and Jennifer Stella of the University of Toronto took people up to the observation deck of a tall tower at the University of California, Berkeley. Compared with a control group, these participants were more likely to report a greater sense of humility and that the direction of their lives depended on many interacting forces beyond their own agency. Right as Keltner, all shift us from a competitive dog-eat-dog -dog mindset to perceive that we are part of networks of more interdependent, collaborating individuals. This just stretches the surface of the social and the busy psychological upsides, so we'll return to them later in BBC Futures immense artists series, but Keltner summarizes it like this. All brings us joy, meaning, and community along with healthier bodies and more creative minds. It quietens the nagging, self-critical, overbearing, status-conscious voice of ourselves, our ego, and empowering us to collaborate, to open our minds to wonders. 
and to see the deep patterns of life. Wonderful world. The Victorian geologist Charles Liel once wrote that there is an inevitable discomfort that comes when approaching the vast unknowns of the universe, describing a painful sense of our incapacity to conceive a plan of such infinite extent. To illustrate how he felt, Liel described a circle of light expanding into the dark. It illuminates as it goes, but as its circumference grows, so does the boundary between light and the dark. In other words, he was suggesting that the more we learn, the more we become aware of our true insignificance and how little we know. While the scheme of the universe may be infinite, both in time and space, it is presumptuous to suppose that all sorts of doubt and perplexity would ever be removed. Real wrote, This is true, but that does not mean that we shouldn't try ever harder to understand our place within the immense world out there. When approaching the unknown, the psychologist Frank K. talks about the power of wonder which he describes as a more active, engaged sense of awe. Wonder is the, the engine that drives innovation and inquiry. It tells me the accidental impetus behind humanity's greatest achievements. It implores us to ask how, what, where, when, what if. It is one of the most powerful motivations we have as humans and no one can take it away from us, he says. In the age of the Anthropocene, we may need this attitude more than ever if we are to navigate the enormous challenges of the coming decades without falling into the twin traps of dismissive hopeless or paralyzing dread than the lens, the lens of sublimity awe or wonder may be necessary. With these perspectives, we can approach the daunting unknowns of our time with authentic, mindful reverence bolstered by the collective power of human thought and imagination. When I look back at that overwhelming day in Wales more than a decade ago, staring up at cloud-capped Snowdon, I knew little about the philosophy of the sublime or the psychological benefits of awe and wonder. What mattered was how it felt in that moment. Perhaps it's part of the human condition to seek solace in immensity. But now I know all that I do. I actively seek out such encounters wherever I can find them, aware of all the enriching benefits that can follow. Sometimes it's good to feel small. Richard Fisher is a senior journalist for his future.